<laughs> Let's get this show on the road. So we're going to talk about uh, virality. Uh, we may talk a bit about virility since we have uh, Mr. Webster on the line with us. This is an area in which he... Whoa, 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 whoa. How is this only Mr. Webster's virility? <laughs> So my name is Eric Boggs. I'm the CEO at Argyle Social, developers of social media management product for the stars. And as you've already met, uh, Tom Webster's here with us. Tom's the VP of Marketing at Edison Research, a very busy man during this uh, election season. And Jay Bear, my partner on the Social Pros podcast from Convince and Convert, celebrated social media speaker, author extraordinaire. Thanks for joining the call, folks. Delighted to Delighted. be here. And happy to be celebrated in any way, shape, or form. Especially, especially as virile. <laughs> in, indeed. Uh, well, hold on to that thought for one second, Tom. Uh, so uh, a few quick notes. Uh, we're going to do Q&A at the end of the call. Uh, the hashtag for this shindig is virality. We're recording the show. Uh, it usually takes us a day or two to get that buttoned up and shipped. So um, we'll have this email to all attendees. Um, probably Monday uh, next week we'll include the, the recording and the slides. Uh, brief shout out, I mentioned Social Pros. This is a production that Jay and I put on uh, every week, a uh, podcast featuring real people doing real work in social media. Our guests include uh, Scott Monty from Ford, Vanessa from Hilton, uh, Justin from Citrix, and, and on and on and on. And uh, Jay, Social Pros is, is usually the highlight of my week. I don't know, I don't know if you can say the same. It's certainly the highlight of my Monday. <laughs> yeah, it makes Mondays a little more bearable. Uh, Jay and Tom, another quick shout out. Um, work together on uh, the social habit. Can can you sort of do a brief uh, intro of the social habit and what you guys are all about, Mr. Webb? Yeah. So you know, we're obviously Edison is a, is a research company. The thing we're probably best known for are the exit polls for the elections, which we're gearing up for now. But we're applying that same sensibility and methodology to a quarterly series. A research series that is a representative study of American social media users 12 plus. So I mean a lot of what we're going to talk about today in terms of making content uh, viral or, or virile in the case of Jay Bear is uh, a lot of it has to do with content and so what's in the social habit is the, the, the kind of content that makes people respond on social media, the kind of content people like to pin on Pinterest, the kind of content uh, by vertical that people are interested in following brands for. So it's something that we're collaborating on to try and bring more credible and quality information to the space. And you guys have a big product release coming in the very near future. We do actually. Our first, uh, the first wave of this series, the the fall wave, is going to come out October 11th. And again, that's a paid report, and you can find out more about it at socialhabit.com. Awesome. Uh, if you're just now joining the show, uh, hashtag for the webcast is virality. Uh, Garrett, the community manager at Argyle, at G Button is going to be listening on the, the back channel, answering questions and you know, fanning the, the viral flames. Uh, go ahead and save the date for our next presentation. Uh, it's going to be led by Mr. Webster. It's actually part one of a 12-part webinar, webinar series about sexuality and quantitative research. It's called Virility, uh, how I have it, I being uh, Mr. Webster. Uh, so, Tom, I'm really looking forward to this content. Well, I'm here in Bloomington, Indiana. Well, it's a lot of personal anecdotes, but there is some data. <laughs> I'm here in Bloomington, Indiana, home of the Kinsey Institute, so if you need some uh, first-person research, Tom, I can hook you right up. Yeah, I don't. Uh, all right. They have, a, they have an unbelievable human sexuality museum right on campus at IU. I'm not kidding. It's really quite spectacular. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll reserve comment on that. Um, Someday, Eric, you can be a docent at the Human Sexuality Museum. You know, those are things to long for, you know, life goals, really. Uh, so so let's, get, let's, let's move the uh, hilarious banter on to more uh, topical, uh, topical items. So let's talk about uh, virality. It's kind of a funny word, and it's, and it's a buzzword, but, you know, when your experience with, with clients, Jay, what's kind of the, the, the context of, of virality in terms of what people are hoping for or what people uh, hope to get from it? Well, I think there's a lot of classic definitions, but but the one I, I prefer is that it's a communication that, that spreads through no direct effort of your own. Yeah. That, that reaches a disproportionate number of people uh, indirectly. Uh, that, that sort of um, 
was it Breck shampoo? You know, she tells two people, and she tells two people, and she tells two people, and ev- and all of a sudden everybody has shiny hair. Yeah. Uh, that that premise that that you know you can reach X number of people uh, through email or any number of other uh, ways directly, but that uh, those people will then tell their friends uh, or their associates or people in general, uh, and that they will then become aware of it, and it takes on a life of its own. Uh, that is, of course, the hope, um, but it's also uh, a hope that you will win the Triple Crown, and that hasn't happened until for 45 years until today. Yeah, yeah, and and we've got some data to to share that that really points to the difficulty of well, achieving and, virality. And honestly, too, Eric, in terms of that, you know, having seen that data, I think uh, I would agree with Jay. There's also a time series component to that. If I premiere a, a video or some piece of content and it gets seen by a million people over a hundred years, I'm a plotter. If it gets seen yeah. by a million people over a week, then I've, I've gone viral. So there's certainly, there's a dramatic time series component to what we consider to be viral. Yeah, yeah right. Did, did the Bible go viral? No, but it sold Not a lot so of much. Bills. Yeah, exactly. Number one bestseller, though. Yep. Triple number rainbow. Five. Amazon, number three in this category. <laughs> so w- when uh, we were prepping some of this content, um, I hearken back to my days in Linda Bray's biology class at North Gaston High School and thought about um, you know, the life cycle of a virus. And you know, we're we're thinking about virality from the perspective of the marketer or the community manager or the social person. But you know, even in you know biochemistry, there are some inputs required. There is a host cell that you want to infect. There is a payload by which that you want to you know, with which you want to infect them, and then there's this delivery mechanism, and you know that's proteins and RNA and mitochondria and things that I don't really remember very well in biology. But when you look at this from from the marketer view, it's your content, uh, typically delivered via some channel. Uh, for you know the purposes of this conversation, we're primarily focusing on social, um, but you know I know Tom has some thoughts about how you know, channels can work together to drive virality. Uh, that content goes through a, a host cell, a person, and the conversion rate of that person to some desired outcome, um, a view, uh, a share, a purchase, or some sort of desired marketing action is actually really low. Um, but you know, there is the hope that this person is sharing, and then those people are sharing, and, and so on and so forth. Um, with, with respect to content, Tom, I know you had some thoughts about evergreen content versus sort of ephemeral social tweety type content. Well, I know we're going to touch on this with the data a little bit more, but it's something, uh, you know, one of the pieces of research or the series that we put out with Edison over the years is a series on podcasts. And I know you and Jay do a podcast every week with social pros. And, you know, the great thing about podcasts is there's a lot of evergreen content, right? Your podcast can live for months and months and years and years, depending on the type of content it is. But the, ne- the negative, the downside to having evergreen content is that there's no impetus to share it immediately. And part of being viral is the, the need or the impetus to share something immediately, whether it's something that's topical that will that is obviously ephemeral or something that is being driven by some kind of a, uh, you know, an immediate or urgent event. And I think there's some urgency to that, either the feeling that you're going to miss out if you don't get on board or the feeling that it will be over soon, so it's time to pile on. So uh, as, as important, I think, as evergreen content is, Ephemeral content is equally important to having something go viral, and I think the metaphor you used about a payload, having a payload to deliver in the midst of that virus is crucial, otherwise it's just a wasted effort. Yeah, yeah but isn't, isn't sometimes, though, isn't that payload, that uh, time sensitivity, a false construct? I mean, God love them, but, but not everything on Mashable is breaking news, but yet for Mashable, everything is breaking news. Yeah. Um, and, and it seems like at some point if you say, Quick, you know, this needs to be read right now because it's important in the moment. At some point, that's that's not accurate. Um, but a lot of people play that game very effectively uh, with their content and, and say, look, this this is an evergreen topic, but we're going to put a instantaneous veneer around it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, or, I think that's absolutely true. But I think also when you you bring up Mashable, I mean, Mashable is almost a mainstream media channel. I mean, there are a gajillion people that automatically retweet Mashable that essentially turn it into a mass media channel, and that's really part of what makes things go viral. Yeah. You know, another piece that I see, kind of an extension from from that, is taking existing content 
and just restating it. Um, not even with with a, with a veneer of exclusivity or breaking, but basically writing the na news article you wrote four weeks ago and just writing it again. Um, the, the example that, that, that made me think of this is a lot of the crap going on at the University of North Carolina and athletics and scandal. And the local newspaper here in Raleigh, the News, news and Observer, is is really kind of latched onto this story. And there was a news article that was published today that's getting a lot of chatter on like the nerdy Carolina basketball fan boards that I read. But I read the article and I was like, this is exactly what they said four weeks ago, and you guys are all over it talking about it. Um, and there's nothing new here. Um, but sometimes, think, though, you can use that as almost a, a reverse curation. I'll give you an example for what we're doing at Convince and Convert. So we have for... Um, about a year or so now ran one or two guest posts on our blog every week. Uh, and that's been, been pretty successful. But we decided to change that system going forward. What we do is we find, instead of having people write us guest posts from scratch, we're finding posts that have been published elsewhere uh, and that we find to be particularly interesting or have done well from a viral coefficient perspective. And then we say, hey, can we take this post that you wrote on Mashable or somewhere else uh, can we rewrite it a little bit and then put it on Convince and Convert for our audience? Because that way we know it's already satisfied a burden of virality. Uh, and that approach, uh, I think, is going to be very, very successful. Yeah. So let's actually dig into um, a story. Uh, this relates to uh, an Argyle customer that is pretty cool. And it's the Showtime Lakers, uh, Lakers Nation, uh, which is a fan site, a community site with millions of readers every month. Um, about the Los Angeles Lakers basketball team. So we, we've done a ton of research around this, and, and we're going to show you lots of mind-numbing charts and graphs here very, very shortly. Um, you know, we looked at some aggregate data, we looked at some special case data, and the Lakers Nation handle was one that popped out at us for a couple reasons. So they have a very large following, following on uh, Twitter, which is where we focused our research, uh, at 120,000 followers. But it's not huge. But what these guys have been able to generate in terms of virality in, in this instance in the form of a retweet has been nothing short of staggering. And so we polled the most viral tweets for Lakers Nation, which is a fan site with 120,000 followers, versus the official Lakers um, Twitter handle. And the results were stark. So... For example, the most retweeted content of the past few months for these guys, uh, almost 13,000 retweets for Lakers Nation with 120,000 followers versus 6,000 retweets for official Lakers with almost 3 million followers. And the content is pretty similar. It's all about the, the new starting five of the Lakers. It all has a time component. All this is happening as the Lakers were signing Dwight Howard and signing Steve Nash. So there is, is a timeliness to it. Um, what do you guys think is driving this um, from the perspective of a fan community site versus the, the official uh, official Lakers site? I don't know what is driving it, but at first glance, and, and I, I know what the next slide looks like, but I'm going to pretend that I don't. Um, you look at the Lakers official has a hashtag in every tweet. Um, in some cases, forms the tweet as a question, which might be perhaps a better Facebook construct than a Twitter construct, um, and is less declarative uh, than, than the, at Lakers Nation. But, but even at that, those are perhaps important, perhaps unimportant, but, yeah. but they are linguistic sort of phrasing differences. But, but I think the juxtaposition is sound that the content is relatively similar, and with um, uh, you know, one twenty-fourth the number of followers, um, they are getting twice as many, or at least the same number of retweets. It's it's pretty staggering. Sure. So we well, the we other found thing too. I mean, I think it's. I was just gonna say, I think it's fair to say that Lakers Nation is probably a subset of the official Lakers, uh, yeah. and you know, and there's some kind of gravitation, some natural affinity to be a more core Lakers follower. And if you buy that, things like this sort of bubble up from pockets of passionate people. I think that has a lot to do with it too. Yeah, that's a good point, and that's something we'll, we'll talk about is um, intensity of interest and, and overlap of interest. Well, we found that the 80-20 rule applies for the Lakers Nation, namely that you know 80% of the retweets come from 20% of the, the retweeters. 
um, we found that about 2,000 retweeters have retweeted one out of every 400, um, but we found six are retweeting one out of 20. So some folks are, you know, it's, they're pretty much coin operated. You know that you're going to get some sort of viral component. These are highly, highly engaged uh, folks. But even that, you know, there's kind of this broad base of people that are that are um, you know, fairly engaged with what the folks are sharing. You know, 10% basically um, uh, of the audience is, is a is a is um, sorry, I'm kind of getting my math my, my math um, my math uh, gummed up here. A, a very large percentage of the audience is retweeting the content, um, but a lot the the primary um, drivers of the retweets are coming from a very small audience, and actually we have um, a graph that illustrates that, particularly from the perspective of the vir virality of the retweets. So I know, I know, Mr. Bear, you 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 kind of had some uh, some additional thoughts around the data that that we churned up with this report. Yeah, I think um, we we've got a finer point on in a moment, but this belief that we tend to have uh, in social media and in Twitter in particular that you've got X number of followers and that the, the the percentage of your followers that will retweet you should be roughly equivalent to the same percentage of people that would uh, click on an ad or or take any other sort of digital action that that sort of you know point three to three percent uh, kind of ratio that we typically think about as as standard conversion rates for almost all things digital is just flat not true. In fact, I remember a blog post that Mr. Webster wrote not too long ago, uh, I think at the beginning of the year or so, about that that concept, right? That you think that you've got all these followers and you may have a lot of followers. Some of them may be robots, but you, you have a lot of followers. But the percentage of those followers that you can convince to either click or retweet is a very, very small percentage. Well, the other yeah. thing that I would point out here is I would caution the people paying attention to this webinar not to make a false choice. So it's it's very easy, and we're going to see some very compelling data about the value of Laker Nation and the retweets. But remember, that doesn't happen in a vacuum, right? I mean, if you remember when the double rainbow video went quote, viral. It went viral because Jimmy Fallon talked about it. Yep. And Lakers Nation doesn't happen without Lakers. And so, yes, we have two accounts here. We have one that's a very high engagement account with a lower reach. We also have another with a lower engagement but a much higher reach. They both happen in the same ecosystem. Yeah. Yeah, and, it, and it's not just the Lakers, but it's also a uh, sort of a watershed event with the signing of Dwight Howard and sort of a re reconstruction of the team. So it's this combination of high visibility, high profile presence with high profile event or transaction taking place. That, that's well, and also, I think to Tom's point, it doesn't happen in a vacuum because there are other uh, ties that individual followers have with that brand that may drive propensity to redistribute. So Lakers Nation is a, a very comprehensive blog. And in fact, I, I I have no way of judging this, um, uh, you know, sort of fairly, but but just from a kind of casual glimpse, I would say that Lakers Nation publishes more content, more valuable content, and more interesting content, both from a qualitative and quantitative perspective, than anything officially Lakers. So people may be more prone to retweet Lakers Nation because they take more away from the relationship with that brand in general, right? It's not just about what they are on Twitter. What they are on Twitter is a symptom uh, or the tip of the spear of what they are below the waterline. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great point. And just to kind of backtrack a little bit, I uh, saw some tweets about this comparison. This is all public data, so it, it's not like we have some sort of magic access or magic wand. If you find yourself in a competitive ecosystem and you want to do similar comparison, you know, this is a Twitter API call and some MySQL trickery. I mean, granted, you need to know someone that can do that stuff, but, um, you know, there's nothing magical uh, about getting access to this. You, you just kind of need to know how to slurp in the data and then manipulate it. The other thing I'd, I'd love to point out here really quick, just because I saw a tweet about this, is that, you know, if you look at the content differences between the two, 
you know, one has a, a, you know, a question mark and link and the other one may not. I think it's, it's not necessarily the right approach to look at the differences in content here. It's sort of the difference, I do a lot of work in traditional media research and we talk a lot about the difference between core and cum. The cum is the cumulative reach of a certain media and, uh, and the, the core obviously are the really hardcore fans. And I think what we're seeing here is not a difference in content, but a difference in the type of person who tweets this content. And Lakers Nation may aggregate people that are more passionate about caring about sharing that content. They're more core as opposed to the Lakers. Well said, sir. Let's let's dig into some additional um, uh, uh, data here. So we took a data set of um, one million tweets from thousands of, of Twitter accounts. These are our customers' Twitter accounts. Uh, I'll say again that we're not sharing any sensitive information. We're sharing public, uh, publicly available. Uh, Twitter information you get from the Twitter API. Analyze a million tweets, over 10 million retweets, a uh, diverse set of industries, verticals, and sizes. So, you know, uh, you know with at the risk of offending Mr. Webster, uh, a fairly representative set of uh, companies and, and, and Twitter accounts. And we pulled this over the past 12 months. And we found some interesting nuggets. Uh, one, 60% of retweets uh, happen in the first 60 minutes of a tweet. In kind of the extension of this is that 95% of retweets happen in the first 24 hours. So this gets back to some earlier comments that you guys made about timeliness. That you know, virality either happens or it doesn't happen, and it tends to be at least on Twitter. And it tends to be in this case, if you're not getting it in the first 24 hours, it's unlikely that you're going to get it. And that stands to reason, right? Just because people have such a, a crowded stream now, as more and more people have gotten involved in Twitter, uh, the average number of people that that we follow, I think, has gone up um, concurrently. And and so, how often do you log on to Twitter and say, "Well, let me scroll down for you know more than an hour's worth of tweets," unless you follow a, a small number of people, and, and that's not necessarily a bad idea, uh, or if you have a very tightly controlled set of Twitter lists. Um, an hour is is you know conceivably hundreds of pieces of content ago uh, in the Twitterverse, and so that you know what you know 60 minutes seems like not that long, but 60 minutes worth of content is a boatload of content in some cases. Yep. And you know, contrast this with with other mediums. I mean, I would love to have done this same research around YouTube videos and and other types of content because there are plenty of instances where YouTube video just kind of sits out there on the web and then gets, you know, the bump months later or, you know, sometimes even longer. So this, you know, this well, it, this insight is uniquely Twitter related. I think it is, but I also think things go viral within 24 hours of an event. And that mm -hmm. event does not necessarily relate to when that content was published. And I, I mentioned earlier the Double Rainbow video. The Double Rainbow video languished on YouTube for three to six months, right, before yep. Jimmy Fallon talked about it. That was the event, not the publishing of that content. And once that event happened, it, quote, went viral because it had the push of network television behind it. Yeah. yeah and, and that, uh, do you have other instances where, in mind, where you've seen marketers or um, sort of talking heads like Jimmy Fallon sort of use cross-channel to drive virality of a single piece of content? I know, you know, sort of the, the YouTube video discussed online is kind of the obvious uh, case in point, but I'm just wondering if anything else kind of pops, comes to mind, or if you guys have experience with, with other examples that are that are similar. I see it all the time, even, yeah, even so with my own work. You know, you, you, know you, you write a blog post and you put it out there and then you know, down the road a little bit. It's usually not, you know, three to six months, but it, but it could certainly be three to six days or or perhaps one to three weeks. Um, somebody finds that post or or maybe you recite all your own post in an email or something like that and, and somebody who has a high social graph um, promotes that that uh, that blog post and, and then all of a sudden you get this whole new uh, storm of traffic to it. It happens to me probably two or three times a month. Yeah. And I just saw a case study recently from Symantec to give you kind of a, a B2B example here. Symantec uh, treats videos not like viral videos per se, but like online commercials. Mm -hmm. And so they market their marketing 
and when they had a number of videos go uh, go viral within the IT space about cloud availability and uh, Windows migration products, it's because they promoted those videos. They bought Facebook ads, they bought ads in YouTube that were targeted directly at IT professionals, and they carpet bombed the heck out of it. So when those videos uh, went viral per se, it's because they had an enormous amount of other cross-channel promotion. And the goal of those videos was to download a white paper, which is the, the catnip of the IT industry. And that actually worked because they were able to drive people in a short period of time to look at those videos. And again, the end result of those videos dumped you into downloading a white paper. But they promoted the heck out of it. They didn't leave it to chance, I think, is the yeah. message there. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's an excellent point, something we'll, we'll definitely get to um with the end is thinking more strategically about how to. Well, I mean, I think that's, that's that's one of the the fallacies of virality, yeah. is that people think that that you will have this tsunami effect within a single channel, and and in most cases, anything that is viral or becomes viral, I should say, has some sort of cross-channel pollination. Uh, but this idea of well, we'll just put it on YouTube, and a bunch of people on YouTube will pass it around, that doesn't really work. So let's keep moving forward because I know there's a lot of stuff we want to cover here. Um, unsurprisingly, uh, this aligns with, with a little bit with what you just said, Jay. Most accounts don't get the viral bump. So a very, 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 very small fraction of uh, of the sample that we evaluated get you know lots and lots of retweets. I mean, the the slope of that curve gets pretty pretty steep, uh, and the the long tail is awfully long. And you know this stands to reason again. You know the companies that are far far up this curve are the Lakers. Um, there are some other interesting uh, interest areas that, that we'll uncover here that that are also uh, at that end of the curve. But I think this aligns with what you just said, Jay. You know those companies have the right, or these organizations have the right um, context and sort of the, the right brew of stuff around them. But it sounds like there's definitely some strategic thinking that goes into Yeah, I mean, I, what, what I find really interesting about this particular chart, uh, one, I grew up in a small town in Arizona, and there's a girl I knew in junior high who had a, a viral bump, but that's a different uh, presentation entirely. Um, but what, what we're looking at here is is account retweet rates, not individual retweets on a particular tweet. So what we're, what we're looking at here is that there are companies or organizations that do this well repeatedly. Yes. So it's not about catching lightning in a bottle. It's about having a consistent source of lightning. And that's a totally different way of thinking, right? It's not about let's let's send out that's why there's all of this quote unquote thinking out there about how do you create the perfect tweet and how do you deconstruct it and how many words should it be and should the link be at the beginning or the link be at the end. And it's hokum. It's nonsense. Yeah. Uh, because it's not about sending out one great tweet. It's about can you send out tweets that are consistently successful. And some of that is how you use Twitter, of course. But I think more of it lies below the waterline, which is what kind of relationship does your account or your company have with these followers? And that relationship is about more than Twitter. The other Twitter, thing, too, Twitter is, is, a, think... is a symbol of success. It's not success. We, we fall in love with business fables a lot, right? There's a mythology about the, the successful business case study. And Old Spice. We look, at things like, we look at things like Old Spice. We look yeah. at things like Amazon, and we think, all you, have to do, all you have to do is believe and be passionate and be transparent and share with your audience. Well, there's, yeah. for every person who does that, there's a million that also do it and fail. And I think what works here is a portfolio approach such that the people who are consistently successful over time are consistently successful because they are flooding a lot of content out there and something's going to hit right but often we celebrate the case studies of the piece of content that hits but we don't look at the totality of effort behind that account as Jay says they have probably tried 20 different things yeah yeah or the 20 pieces of content that didn't hit also great right. point great point so l let's move ahead there are a couple kind of um, silly data points we put together that may or may not be silly. Uh, we we had another marketing partner ask us about surfacing this data and, and we went out and found it and, and thought we'd share it here. We evaluated uh, Twitter posts containing exclamation points and found that they got about on average 50% um, uh, 50, 50 more retweets. So the average percentage of followers to retweet a post is about 50% higher 
uh, for the posts with exclamation points. This gets a, 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 a little bit to what Jay just said about you know constructing the perfect tweet. But you know when we thought about this, we considered maybe exclamation points uh, are some sort of proxy for passion or excitement around an event. Um, those are maybe the things that that are underlying this that, that drive uh, retweets. I mean that's obviously circumstantial. I was curious to get your guys' thoughts around these data points. We didn't study the the impact of multiple exclamation points on on that rate, however, correct? So it's not one versus two versus three versus seven. Yeah, yeah, sorry, it's, it's one exclamation point. That's one more headline on my part, but it's, it's, one, it's one or more, you know, does it contain an exclam exclamation point or does it not contain an exclamation yeah. point? Well, I think one of the things that we have found in the social habit research that we'll be releasing next week is that there is a large number, I don't remember the exact number, nor could I tell you, um, I can only hint at it, but there is a large number of people who retweet blindly, who yeah. who just hit that button without ever clicking the link, presuming that there's a link behind it. In many cases, there are, uh, and and so perhaps that this, as you said, Eric, this sense of urgency and excitement, and this is important that that the exclamation mark is um, sort of a symbol uh, that indicates you know you should pay disproportionate attention to this. Uh, and it is disproportionately worthy uh, of a retweet. I think that's a, uh, a, a somewhat frightening and um, simplistic view of things, but but it wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. So there, there's an interesting corollary here to the to the previous. Uh, we also looked at posts with question marks, and not surprisingly, posts that contain a question mark uh, on average get have gotten about 70% more replies than posts without. So asking a question does indeed um, prompt an answer more so than not not. Uh, you know, not particularly answering the question. You know, uh, I, I often I often look at this kind of research, Eric, with uh, you know the kind of what words show up in the most retweeted tweets and, and things like yeah. that, with a, a fair amount of skepticism, right? I mean, I think uh, the most retweeted tweets probably have the word "the" in them, so I would encourage all of our listeners <laughs> use "the" and "a" and, and proper nouns. But this one actually gets my attention because I think it's right. I mean, this abstracts it a bit and doesn't. Uh, focus on an individual word or phrase, which could happen at random, but this one actually, I think, means something. I'm positive there's a correlation here. I'll be, if you ask for the order, you'll get the order. Yeah. Do we yeah. have uh, uh, any research on the impact of the umlaut on retweet rate? Because <laughs> our, our listeners in Germany are asking. Umlauts uh, actually um, get a uh, uh, well above average reply of rock you like a hurricane. <laughs> we actually we had a whole uh, last year Edison put out an entire report on that called Let Me See Your Diphthong. <laughs> <laughs> oh geez, that's good stuff. Uh, so let let's keep trucking forward here. Um, I want to talk about targeting influencers, and this brings up uh, some uh, this resurfaces some interesting points you made earlier, Jay, about. Um, you know, big influencers driving virality. And from our research and, and from some third-party research, you know, there is this perception that big influencers are the, the, the things that drive shares. But, you know, the reality for most um, social marketers and, and, and marketers in general, it's actually the small following uh, influencers, the minnows, if you will, that at a very large volume um, share and, and reshare your content that drive the virality. I know this contradicts a little bit of, of what you said with Jimmy Fallon, but those are, uh, you know, those are outliers, right? I don't know that it does contradict it, Eric. Because no, I don't either. As, as Tom said, there there is a there is a zero event for virality, uh, and and that zero event is occasionally, although very rarely, publication or existence, um, germination, if you will. Usually, there is some other zero moment event that that triggers that effect. And in some cases, it is a big influencer making that initial tweet, the initial Facebook share, the initial whatever. But when you then go back and look at the math, it's it's perhaps one person who's the first ripple in the pond. But all the concentric ripples are are tens, hundreds, thousands, ten thousands of of other people who have relatively small following. So if you look at the number of big versus level influencers, yes, it will always be. Uh, far more uh, small influencers, but but in many cases they are prompted to act 
uh, by by a tipping point event, which you know goes back you know to to decades of research uh, in in how things happen, and even even the tipping point itself um, from Gladwell is a, a good example of that same dynamic happening offline. We we got some data from. Um... And it's actually in the notes. There's a link to this in the notes of the slide, so you'll have that when we send it around. From BuzzFeed, I guarantee you if you're listening uh, to this uh, webcast and you have an internet connection, you have looked at BuzzFeed.com. You might not realize it, but these guys have got viral marketing down to a science uh, in terms of the way they curate their content. And, you know, they're, these are the guys that do, like, you know, top 25 worst glamour shots photos or whatever, right? Uh, but the, the website's blowing up. Uh, and, and they were the ones that, that sort of provided this quote that stories go viral when lots of people engage with their normal size circles to share content. And so their model isn't go out and get Jimmy Fallon or go out and get, you know, the Jimmy Fallon of your industry to, to share your stuff. It's about kind of meat and potatoes one at a time, you know, normal people sharing and sharing and sharing content. And what's interesting about this is, is it's not about clout score, right? So this isn't about finding universal influence because that isn't always useful. Um, you know, minnows, by definition, don't necessarily have uh, influence. It's more about people that help you generate engagement, people that care deeply about what you are sharing. Well, yeah, I think about it's the thing about clout, the... clout for brands, right? Clout for the individual organization. There are people who have clout with a C for Lakers Nation who don't have clout with a C for Lakers Official or yeah. more to the point perhaps who have clout with a C for Lakers Nation who don't have clout with a C for Suns Nation um, for obvious reasons, right? And, and so this idea of universal influence is, is, is very tidy I think is useful in some ways. I, I'm on record as saying that I'm not a, a bachelor of clout. In fact, I think influence scoring is, is eminently useful in many ways. But as an individual company, when you think about it from an individual company perspective, what you need to find are the people who care enough about you to be influential for you. And that is, yeah. by definition, circumstantial. Yeah. Well, the other thing, too, about this is that, you know, we spend a lot of time with influence measures. And I'm not going to bash influence measures, but they are a measure of hope. They are a predictive measure. There's somebody that has a number assigned to them, and we hope that that person will spread my message far and wide. And so we spend a lot of time focusing on that person or a small group of people to try and spread our content. But there's actually demonstrable evidence, if you use any kind of social media monitoring whatsoever, of, of minnows, as you call them here, actually spreading that kind of content, actually convincing their friends to watch a video or read a link or click on this or click on that. So we don't actually need a predictive measure. And I, you know, if you think about just understanding people in general, Everybody is part of some peer group, and in that peer group, there's always one or two people that that small peer group look to to recommend things. Yeah. Right. I'm all. I mean, I'm always getting people asking me to recommend things like headphones and types of gin and uh, and gin. So I, you know, I recommend those things to people <laughs> because I I have some credibility with a small group of people, and so the issue there is not trying to find me in cloud or cred or or some other measure as someone with some kind of global influence. It's observing in the wild people like me or people like my friends actually influencing people to look at something. That's that's out there. It's in the wild. It doesn't require any kind of a predictive measure. Certainly. It, 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 this aligns with some uh, – I just want to kind of briefly plug a bit of technology that we're building in Argyle. What you described, Tom, aligns really well with, with some product we're building, which is uh, essentially um, – sort of internal influence management for community managers. Basically, this idea of tagging uh, customers, tagging big customers, tagging small customers, uh, tagging highly influential customers inside of your social community and proactively managing these people. Uh, some of them, you know, may be, you know, whales from the perspective of they pay your business a lot of money and it really matters who they are and what they say. But it may be just, uh, you know, someone that, that aligns with what you just described, Tom, maybe highly influential in a very small community in a very um, sort of narrow way, but that is enormously valuable for your company and your brand. Uh, so I want to jump forward and talk about uh, why people retweet it and why people share content. And, and we've got some interesting stuff to, to share 
here as well. The kind of the, the tried and true uh, data that you see uh, shared around word of mouth advertising actually comes from 1966. Uh, it's from I'm not actually sure if there's a book or an article um, from Ernest uh, Dijkstra uh, that sort of highlights why people share. Uh, product involvement, you know, the product exceeding my expectations and warrants sharing. Self-involvement, uh, I know a lot about the product or subject matter and this is why I want to share it. Uh, other involvement, meaning I want to help other people make better decisions uh, around a certain area or a certain service or product. And then message involvement, which is the message is just funny or helpful or in some other way entertaining and that warrants sharing. So this is some you know, age-old research to maybe give you a framework or structure to think about virality and think about why people um, share what they share. And the interesting lens here for me is that it's often, um, you know, I'm not sharing something because of me. I'm often sharing something because of what I want other people to think of me or how I want to impact other people. Well, and that's one of the that's one of the things that we found in all of the research we did on things like uh, Pinterest, for example, in the social habit. There are differential types of people, and there are differing types of content, and people share different types of content and different types of products, for example, are pinned for very different reasons. There are specific types of products that people pin because they plan to buy it, but there are also specific types of products that people pin because they want to identify themselves with those products, and that's more kind of aspirational and sending social signals. So. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, and about this particular diagram, I mean, this research was done at a time when we essentially had two kinds of networks. We had one-to-one, -one, where I talked to my neighbor, and we had one-to-many, the kind of mm -hmm. Sarnoff model, the broadcast model. Now we have a very different model extant with many-to-many, -many, with the majority of Americans engaging in social media, and that might throw this diagram completely on its keister. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see you kind of a, a, a mass market sort of reprisal of this study. So uh, another way that, you know, and this is a comment that, that Garrett, our community manager, drew. Um, uh, another way to think about a retweet is, you know, telling somebody else's joke, right? People, you know, people share things that they think their followers want to hear, that they think will resonate with their followers. I mainly shared this because I thought the comment was kind of kind of interesting. So I want to get, get back to the, the data that we aggregated, and we we wanted to look at the accounts that had the highest retweet rate. Uh, these are these are the accounts that, that Jay said earlier uh, have a consistent flow of, of lightning in the bottle. These guys are good at it. Uh, and we looked at the top 50 uh, accounts, and overwhelmingly, you know, 21% of the 50 were in sports. It was really interesting to see religion and higher education and entertainment uh, pop up uh, as you know effective uh, viral marketers on Twitter. And you know, to me, it, it, it all kind of boils down to high density, uh, you know, high passion interests, shared interests uh, across the followers. Well, one of the things that we found in the social habit research is that Twitter users in particular, and we're drawing this from Twitter, Twitter users in particular are watching more TV. And there's a tremendous social TV usage for Twitter as a real-time network. And this, again, goes back to that ephemeral versus evergreen comment that we discussed earlier. Sports is a thing that happens in an instant. The score of yesterday's game is not valid two days from now. So that is, you know, in effect, driving a lot of the virality. But one of the things that, uh, that listeners to this webcast might think about is I might have this great piece of evergreen content, but how do I put some kind of a hook on it that actually makes it of the moment? If that's really what you're trying to do is drive virality or virility, depending on the type of content you have. Uh, but sports is that driver in Twitter. Yeah. yeah, our friends at Exact Target have been doing that recently uh, with a lot of infographics around uh, sporting events. Edelman did one last week at the Ryder Cup uh, where it was here's all the tweets about each golfer and each um, – uh, each of the teams and in, in publishing an infographic that modeled that data set, not not because they you know which is which is most effective. Here is a Ryder Cup infographic about the comparative number of tweets for each golfer, or hi, uh, here's a white paper on Edelman's ability to listen to social media. Yeah, what one has a hook and one inherently does not, uh, and and I think you're seeing that uh, in this kind of data point here. Uh, I wanted to provide a, a quick illustration just to, to drive home the point. Um, 
you know, I, I thought about my my personal Twitter usage and kind of think critically about what I talk about or tweet about, and I have a very high follower concentration concentration in social media marketing. Their follower concentration is also very high, so the viral opportunity for me uh, in terms of tweeting about social media marketing is very, very high. When you look at heavy metal music, uh, on the other hand, you know there's Tom and my brother that I know like heavy metal music, but I don't know if any of my other followers like heavy metal music, and I don't know anything about their followers. So the viral opportunity about you know, the upcoming launch of The Sword's new record is probably not going to be very good for me. Um, so this over. is just... <laughs> exactly. October 22nd. Apocryphon is going to be good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and I wanted to show uh, another... This is a screenshot from, from a customer account that shows some interesting ways of um, measuring uh, content interest areas. So these are using Argyle's campaign functionality. This customer has a motivation campaign where they share, share sort of motivational and motivational related content. They have a content marketing campaign and they have a social media campaign. Each of these are content areas and, and they have many, many more that they're tracking. And they're able to track interaction and clicks and, and conversion around these content areas to get a better understanding of you know, interest intersection and what are the things that are driving um, uh, amplification and, and virality inside of their social audience. So let's wrap up. We got 12 minutes until the hour, uh, and I want to talk about some takeaways, some some headlines that you can um, chew on the rest of the day, and maybe some stuff that you can start doing. Um, first takeaway: it's it's unlikely that you're going to catch uh, a, a Gangnam Style moment in, in your social media marketing. Point zero 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 six. Um, that's not six one thousandths. That's six one thousandths of one percent of posts in our sample had a, pi a positive viral coefficient, meaning posts that were retweeted and then retweeted again. So a follower's follower uh, retweeted something. So this gets back to some comments Jay made about recognizing context, recognizing your situation, um, but also understanding that you know this stuff just doesn't happen magically. It has to be um, coordinated, and there's a lot of testing and failure that goes into um, to actually generating you know, positive virality. Well, I think it also highlights, Eric, that hope is not a strategy. And if if I see blog posts, you know, teaching me lessons from Gangnam Style, how to go viral, I'm going to unsubscribe from those immediately. Because there's, I don't know that there's a lesson to draw from business fables like Gangnam Style, to be honest. Yeah. So talking point number two um, is about growing your audience. Minnows, uh, based on a lot of our reading and our own research, are, are actually more valuable in a lot of situations than a handful of whales. And if you think about a comment Jay made earlier about the the conversion rates that we see in social, conversion rate meaning link click or retweet or reply or actual conversion rate, they're very, very small. And for some organizations, you can probably do yourself a big favor by growing your audience. Um, Sorry, I just got a calendar reminder. That's like the tenth time that's happened in <laughs> one of these webcasts. Uh, it, it, for some folks, it's going to be easier to grow your audience than to come up with this lightning in a bottle machine. Uh, and and that goes against some social media best practices, talking head stuff about you know follower count doesn't matter. But you know if you're looking for virality and that is a goal, you want as many minnows in your pond as you possibly can. Yeah, no question. I mean. I've written about this quite a bit. Follower count, of course, matters because ultimately followers don't matter, right? It's about behavior. It's about um, clicks or virality or some sort of behavior that ultimately makes you money or saves you money or both. Uh, and you're exactly right, Eric, that, that the chances of you um, becoming consistently disproportionately good at, at retweets uh, or even clicks is, is probably not a particularly good bet. Yeah, there's definitely some best practices that you can and should adhere to, but you're better off saying, look, our average is going to be our average, so let's just put more people into the bucket, apply yep. that same average, uh, and we will get, by definition, more of the outcomes that we desire. Um, it's just like banner ads, right? You know, Can you have a slightly better banner ad than, than average in terms of click-through rate? Sure you can. Are you going to have a massively better banner ad than average? Typically, no. 
So if what you care about is clicks, and that's a debatable subject, but if you care about clicks on your banner ads, the best way to achieve that is to buy more banner ads. Yep. Takeaway number three, interest intersection drives virality. So we see high-density interest networks like sports teams on religion that are driving viral results. And there's a lot of context here that creates that, but there's also a lot of kind of uh, unified interest in terms of followers and their followers and their followers. So if, if, if virality is something that's important to you, think about framing your, your content in, in your viral strategy around your followers' followers. Uh, don't just say what you want to say. Say what you think sort of the second and third degree want to hear. Well, and we're in this we're in this strange place now, especially in this country, where we've got this extraordinary proliferation uh, of of places that you can go to have your own belief system ratified, right? If you are part of the left-handed vampire should rule the planet and everybody else should die, um, and I'm sure there is a group that that espouses those beliefs. I'm, I'm president of, of the There's Durham a number Chatter. of blogs, right? There's a number of blogs and podcasts that you can read to support that belief system. It doesn't matter how uh, narrow your thinking is, there is a an online tribe for you. And, and so I think part of what we see here is that when people tweet things um, that somebody else can easily retweet that says, yes, that describes me, yep, I've got your back, um, yes, that's how I view the world, uh, that, that has a better chance of, of being retweeted because it's sort of the uh, digital bumper stickering um, phenomenon. Yep. The other thing, too, is that if you are... Uh, you know, to go back to this dichotomy we talked about earlier, about having uh, you know smaller reach but higher engagement, or smaller engagement and higher reach, it's a false choice. The best way to make virality happen is to employ both. And you might yeah. say, well, that's very difficult. I don't have a tremendous amount of reach. That's right. It's very difficult. That's why virality is as rare as Eric just stated. Takeaway number four is all about helping yourself with audience management. We found that you know the 80-20 rule applies with, with virality and retweeters. 80% of the retweets come from 20% of your retweeters. So socialize accordingly. Find a way to tag your frequent retweeters. Find a way to track down the minnows that are maybe providing um, amplification above and beyond uh, the typical minnows. You know, Think proactively about how you can even ask these people for a retweet. Uh, target them with specific email content. Target them through other channels to sort of uh, try to stack the odds in your favor as much as you can. Now, the only thing I would add here is uh, this particular point, Eric, I was not going to retweet, and then I saw the exclamation point, and I was compelled to do it. <laughs> it also Change includes the word on. the also. So this is a statistically, um, you know, uh, st uh, statistically sound in, in terms of a, of a high high production it had, tweet. It had two of the holy trinity. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how we I'm not sure how we can model it, or even if it's possible. But it would be very interesting to run an analysis that shows: Do people have a higher propensity to retweet your stuff going forward if you have thanked them for a retweet at some point? Yeah, and I mean, and that's kind of what what we what we're getting at here. And this gets back to sort of the product preview we uh, uh, we provided, we think that there is a lot of opportunity for um, even businesses with small audiences to get a better understanding of who is inside of that audience. Uh, who are your customers? Who are your prospects? Who are your amplifiers? And be more proactive about retweeting their content, thanking them for participating in a webcast, and, and so on. So, you know, this is an area that, that we really um, think has a lot of opportunity. We're making a lot of product investments here. I want to make a, also a follow-up statement before we go to the Q&A. Um, uh, Tom mentioned the holy trinity of a retweet. It's actually exclamation point, uh, inclusion of the word the, and the, th the third piece of the holy trinity is please retweet. Uh, that's the only missing piece uh, from this content. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, we will uh, wrap up. We will take your Q&A on the Twitters, and we will continue this hilarious banter for another four or five minutes before uh, the three o'clock hour gets here and, and you folks need to move on to, to other things. Thanks, Jay and Tom. This has been awesome. You guys are always a ton of fun. Uh, and thanks everybody for listening in. Uh, look forward to taking your questions.
And let's see what's here. Garrett usually has a, has a lot of these um, uh, written down. Uh, here is one that came in earlier uh, for you, Jay. Have you had any experience? Uh, I'm, I'm kind of reframing the question a little bit. How do you have experience with clients where you're kind of helping them um, find sort of a, a viral model where they are testing content and trying to find influencers? Is there a f framework that you've used? Are there any kind of tips uh, based on your experience to help social marketers be more strategic uh, about you know trying to find viral lift with their content? Yeah, I mean, I think I think first you have to put a rigorous testing and optimization program into place uh, because you cannot run your business on anecdote alone. Um, so, so you need to understand what has changed each time you try that, right? And, and isolate variables and do the kind of things that you would do with, say, uh, an A-B test or a multivariate test or a landing page optimization test. Think about that um, from a content and social media standpoint. It's not always as easy, right? Because you can't run a, a, an A-B Twitter test. And God, I wish you could, but you can't. So not always easy, but that at least that same philosophy of true testing and optimization helps. But I think categorically, I will boil it down simply to what I tell everybody, which is there's only two ways to break through clutter right now. And we've never seen clutter uh, the way we see today, and it's not going to get any better, folks. It's just going to get worse. There's only two ways to break through clutter. Be disproportionately entertaining or be, dis be disproportionately helpful. That's it. right? That's all there is. There's only two options. And for me, I almost always steer clients toward helpful because it is uh, repeatable and scalable, uh, and and you're not probably going to fall flat. The thing about trying to be entertaining um, and, and sort of be wacky and catch lightning in a bottle with that type of approach is that sometimes it's very uncharacteristic for the brand and it's outside of their DNA. And then sometimes you actually offend people and the whole thing blows up in your face. Uh, see that the Dr. Pepper uh, graphic on Facebook from a couple weeks ago where they sort of had the evolution of man, i.e. the evolution of Dr. Pepper, and, and that seemed pretty innocuous until it wasn't. So. Yeah. I, I always try to opt for let's how can we be useful how can we be informational how can we be helpful things like this webinar for example uh, which I'm sure will drive some awareness of Argyle Social and rightfully so uh, but isn't uh, isn't a product pitch and and so uh, I think this is always the, the best way to go. A question for you, Tom, from Jennifer Boudreau. What is your uh, uh, favorite gen? Uh, Plymouth. Plymouth Gen. Thanks for that. Here Plymouth Gen. But I, I'll, I'll piggyback on, on Jay just for a moment there. And remember, if what you are looking for is to go viral, and we can talk about engagement and we can talk about you know small passion groups all you want. If you're looking to go viral, don't kid yourself. You're looking for reach. Yeah. You're looking for metric tonnage. You're looking for yeah. mass. Yeah, you need right? a media buy would be a good idea. Yeah, a media buy is a great idea. And essentially, if you are looking for something to go viral, you're looking for reach, pure and simple, which means you're thinking like a mass media. Welcome to 50 years of mass media research. It's out there. The tools and techniques are out there. You actually have to think that way and not in terms, again, of hope being your strategy. I'll, I'll ping this influencer and then that influencer and uh, close my eyes and underpants and profits, right? It doesn't, it just, yeah. it happens so rarely. You just gave us the stat that that's not the strategy. You have to start thinking like you are indeed a mass media. Understand the people. Yeah, what's funny is you, you sort of have these circumstantial uh, viral successes, and and I, I can count on one hand, probably one finger, uh, a very particular finger, uh, how many times you interview the marketers of that campaign who then say, oh, yeah, we knew it was going to work out like this. We, we, we expected it to go huge. Yeah. Happy, happy accident is not marketing strategy. Yeah. Nope. Let's wrap up with that. It's it's um, it's a little after three o'clock, and I know folks have um, other things to do. And I know Jay and Tom, you guys have other things to do. Jay has got eleven phone calls scheduled for three o'clock. He's missing all eleven of them right now. And Tom's got some exit poll. Uh, he's actually got to go to some polling stations and ask questions as people are walking out the door. So thank you guys for doing the show. This was really good stuff. We've recorded it. We're going to bundle it up and send it out. Thanks, folks, for dialing in uh, and choosing to spend an hour with us. I know that you're really busy, and it means a lot that you chose to hang out with Jay, Tom, and myself. So on uh, Jay uh, and Tom's behalf, my name is Eric Boggs from Argyle. Thanks for listening. We'll talk soon.